So today we're going to continue our discussion on the cellular level of organization, and specifically today we're going to focus on the cell cycle and cell development. So let's go ahead and get started on the cell cycle. Okay, so there, we have to discuss the results of cellular reproduction. What happens during cellular reproduction? There's two things we want to think about. So before a parent cell divides, it duplicates its chromosomes, right? And so the resulting cells, or the daughter cells, have identical chromosomes, right? They're genetically identical. Sort of cloning, if you will. Those are the results. If we look at a typical uh, human karyotype, which is just you know a bunch of chromosomes laid out on a map, right? So one person would have these chromosomes in one of their cells. We can see that humans have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. You'll notice that if we look at a given pair, let's look at uh, pair number one, for example. The one I've highlighted with the red box would have been obtained from this person's father, and then the one that's not highlighted would have been obtained from this person's mother, or vice versa, right? So you get one of each pair from your mother, one of each pair from your father. If we look at cell division, or aka the cell cycle, this is what happens. And I'm going to start at a very basic level and then build from there. So if the first few renditions are a bit uh, elementary or a bit basic, you know, please, please bear with me. I'll get a little more complicated as time goes on. So we start with a parent cell at the top, right? And we end with two daughter cells. If we look at uh, cell, uh, the cell cycle with one chromosome, so this would happen with all 46, but here I just have one illustrated. We would see we start with one chromosome. That chromosome is duplicated. Right, and then what happens is it divides, and then we have, you know, each of the daughter cells has one chromosome. So if this parent cell had this chromosome, this daughter cell would have this one, and then this daughter cell would have this one. So you can see that what we started with and what we ended with are identical. Okay, now I know this is very basic, but we'll build on this in the future slides here. Okay, so to build on this, the cell cycle has three main parts. If we divided them, they'd be called interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. In interphase, there's various events that happen. One of the main ones is uh, chromosomal duplication. Mitosis, what happens is we get chromosome division, right? So chromosomal division. And then what happens is in cytokinesis, that's that final little snapshot where we get the cytoplasm dividing and we have two daughter cells. So uh, if mitosis is chromosome division, then cytokinesis is cell division. We could also draw this in sort of a pie chart, which is nice. So if we look at it, and this is really sort of to scale in terms of time. So if we look at it, interphase takes the most amount of time, and that would be step one. There's three subcomponents of interphase that you'll want to know. One is called G1, or gap one, which is a period of growth before the DNA is duplicated. The next subphase of interphase is called synthesis, and this is where the DNA is duplicated. After that, we have something called G2, and this is where the cell, again, it's for gap, right, gap two, this is where the cell prepares for division. So you can see that interphase by far, if you look at it, is the longest part of the cell cycle. Then if we look at the second stage, mitosis, we have four substages. We have prophase, we have metaphase, we have anaphase, and we have telophase. And we'll talk about those a bit more uh, on future slides here. The next part of the cell cycle, or the final part, is called cytokinesis. This is step three, and this is where the cytoplasm divides. And that is by far the quickest uh, part of the process. Also, throughout the cell cycle, you'll think, see things called checkpoints, right? So there could be a G1S checkpoint, uh, a G2M checkpoint, uh, there's other checkpoints, a spindle uh, assembly checkpoint. In general, what you want to realize is these checkpoints are almost like toll booths if you're driving down the freeway or down the highway. And so what we mean is, you know, just as a toll booth, you'd have to like stop, pay, right? Throw money in the toll and then, you know, move on. If you don't have money, you can't proceed. The same thing happens with checkpoints in a cell cycle. So if the cell has any damage that has happened to it or anything irregular, anything that shouldn't, you know, be normally happening, the checkpoint will stop the cell cycle and one of two things will happen. Either the air will be fixed, that's one, or two, if the air cannot be fixed, the cell will realize that this cell is on the, its way to becoming a cancer cell, right? Because something's really wrong with it. So the second option is to undergo something called apoptosis, which is basically the cell is going to commit cell suicide. And that's a good thing, right, in terms of uh, someone's body, because the cells that are going to become irregular and become cancerous, you want them to spontaneously kill themselves as opposed to proceed, because otherwise you'll get a, a cancerous tumor. Okay, so eukaryotic chromosomes have things called centromeres and telomeres. And I really want to focus on this before we you know, delve back into the cell cycle, because a lot of times I'll say, this is a chromosome. Then I'll point to something that looks very different than it and say, this is a chromosome. And you might say, you know, how could this be one chromosome and this be one chromosome and they look so different from each other? And this slide sort of illustrates that. So it's a technical point, very technical, but it's very important too. Otherwise, it gets very confusing. So 
You'll notice on the left here, I have something that I'm boxing in red. I say this is one chromosome, right? It has a central part called a centromere, and that's where uh, the microtubules will latch on when the chromosomes divide later on. So it's sort of an anchoring point. Uh, specifically, there's a protein on there called a kinetochore, uh, which you see on the right. Uh, the other thing the chromosome has is something called a telomere. And what the telomere is, is the telomere is really sort of... Um, you know, a repeating sequence of DNA at the end of the chromosome that doesn't really have importance beyond the fact that it helps maintain the integrity of the chromosome. You might say, what do we mean by that? Think of it this way. Uh, if you probably tied your shoes this morning, right? Unless you're wearing Velcro, you probably tied your shoes this morning when you, uh, you know, when you left for work or went to school. And so think of it this way. At the end of your shoelace, you have that little tiny plastic part. And that sole function is to maintain the integrity of the shoelace. As that plastic frays, so does the shoelace. And once that plastic goes, your shoelace, you know, is going to have a very uh, uh, short life to it. Telomeres are the same thing. So what they do is they help maintain the integrity of the chromosome. And a lot of people think that telomeres might be associated with aging, right? As someone's telomeres degrade as time goes on, then they age. So that's sort of the function of the telomeres. Okay, so on the left, we have one chromosome. Now on the right, we have something that looks very different, right? It looks like this X structure. And I'm going to tell you that this is also one chromosome. And this is where the confusion comes in. You might say, how can this be one chromosome and this be one chromosome? That makes no sense. And I agree. <laughs> so we have to delve into this a little bit more deeply. So what we're saying is this. The reason why the one on the left is one chromosome is it's one unduplicated chromosome. The one on the right is one duplicated chromosome. And so that makes a little bit more sense. Now we have some way to distinguish the one from the left to the one from the one to the right. You might say, why is it one duplicated chromosome? Because the DNA sequence has been replicated. And so each of those halves of the one duplicated chromosome would be called chromatids, right? So although we have one chromosome on the right, we have two sister chromatids. Once they separate, then they become their own chromosomes. But as long as they're together, we refer to them as one chromosome, and we say they're sister chromatids. Uh, they share a common centromere, uh, and they're together. And, and if this was, uh, let's say, number one from your father, this would also be number one from your father, but just duplicated. And that's why we refer to them as one chromosome. Okay, so let's continue the cell cycle discussion, now that we understand what one chromosome is and one chromosome is when we duplicate it. Okay, so I'm going to draw the cell cycle duplicated, or excuse me, <laughs> duplicate. I'm going to draw the cell cycle with one chromosome all the way through. Remember, this is happening for all 46 human chromosomes in a given cell, but just for simplicity purposes, so we can see the picture. I'm drawing it with one. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this slide, and then I'll show you some actual pictures later on. Okay, so the first part, again, is interphase, right? And we have the three subphases we mentioned, so G1, S, G2. Notice that the big one here is an S. We get duplication of chromosomes, right? So now we have, uh, you know, if this was, let's use a different number, number 15 from the mother. This would be number 15 from the mother, and this would be number 15 from the mother. I separated them, but they're really sort of joined together at this stage. Okay, we go to the second part of the cell cycle. This is where we have chromosomal uh, division. This is called mitosis. So let's look at each part and show you what happens. So the first phase is called prophase. Pro in Greek means before. So I think of it being the first phase. So what happens here is the chromosomes start to condense. And you'll notice that right here. They're getting shorter. They're getting thicker. Also, what you'll notice is the nuclear membrane starts to degrade. So I drew it as a dotted line there. OK, let's look at the next one. The next phase is metaphase. And metaphase, and meta in Greek, means after. right? So it happens after the first one. That's how I remember it. And what happens here is the chromosomes are even further condensed. We have the single chromosome lining up so here's our single chromosome, right? Lining up on something called the metaphase plate. That's that black dotted line. Um, and the sister chromatids are on either side of the plate. Then what you'll notice, too, is that we have our centrosomes or our centrioles uh, at the poles of the cell. And we have our microtubules, these black lines, latching out from each centrosome or centriole uh, to the actual kinetochore on the uh, chromosome centromere. So that's metaphase. When everything's lined up in the middle, that's metaphase. We're getting ready for chromosomal division. The next phase is anaphase. And ana in Greek, I think this is probably more ancient Greek, means as time passes by. And it's very important, uh, very appropriate, actually, because as you can see, what happens here is we get separation of the sister chromosomes. So in this cell, if we back up to metaphase, we have one chromosome. In this cell, now that they've separated, we have one and we have two. All right, so one and one, one plus one, there we go. <laughs> equals two. 
Okay, so we have two chromosomes in anaphase. And so that's the main event that's happening there. We get separation of the sister chromatids. Okay, then what happens is we have telophase. And telos in Greek means the end, right? So this is the end or the last of the mitosis phases. What happens here is the chromosomes start to decondense. They start to open up a little bit again, right? So they're not as thick and not as short. The nuclear membrane starts to uh, reassemble. And the cell membrane starts to divide, right? It starts to divide, not all the way, but it starts. And then finally, what we happen is cytokinesis, and that's the final pinching off of the membrane. And cytokinesis is where we get that cell division. Okay, so you could think again, cell cycle has three parts, right? We covered each of the three, and then each part, uh, except for the last one, has different substages that you want to know as well. Okay, so now we're going to go through the cell cycle again. I'll spend a little bit less time on it because uh, you just saw everything, you know, sort of in a cartoon fashion. Uh, but here I'm going to show it to you with four chromosomes, both in a cartoon picture and an actual microscope image. It's nice to see the reality because uh, reality is never as clear as these little diagrams we draw for you. So I want to make sure you can see an actual microscope image as well. So let's start with uh, mitosis. So we're going to zoom in on mitosis, and that's what we're going to look at right here. So we're looking at the second... Uh, main phase of the cell cycle. Okay, so the first phase of mitosis is prophase. What happens in prophase? In prophase, here's our cartoon picture on the bottom. Here's our real microscope image on the top. Okay, and the main thing to focus here on is that in the real microscope image, the DNA or the chromosomes are in blue. Okay, so what happens? So the chromosomes condense, right? They become um, visible um, as they condense. We see our sister chromatids that are connected. And this mitotic spindle, or these um, uh, microtubules, start to form. Okay, in metaphase, the second one, uh, we have our chromosomes lining up in the metaphase plate. And you'll notice here, how many chromosomes do I have in the middle of the cell? Think about it a second. I have four, right? Remember, four duplicated chromosomes. And here's the metaphase plate on the actual microscope image, looking that way. So you can say we're, we're slightly off axis here, <laughs> but those two red lines are, are supposed to be in the same direction on these images if we twisted the image. Okay, and then finally we have checkpoints that happen you know, throughout as well. Okay, anaphase, as time passes by, right? The sister chromatids split, we have daughter chromosomes. So how many chromosomes do we have in this picture now? Think about it a second. You'll notice we have eight, right? They're each their own chromosome now. Okay. Let's continue. So now we go on to telophase. Telophase, telos means the end. The nuclear membrane starts to reform. The chromosomes decondense, right? The uh, mitotic spindle breaks down and cytokinesis starts to occur, right? Right after this. And so this is sort of what it looks like. And so the fact that you can see these two cells starting to emerge, you know that you're really, um, you know, in telophase, right? They're not completely divided, but you're in telophase. So each one of these soon to be cells has four chromosomes. So there's four in that part. There's four in that part. If I had to call this one cell, because it's not totally separated still, right? So I guess I'd say four plus four equals, right? There's still eight total chromosomes in this cell because it hasn't divided yet. That's why. Okay, so um, let's talk about these chromosomes a bit more. So mitosis generates identical daughter cells, right? With identical DNA in their cell nucleus, or nuclei is plural. Okay, if we look through, uh, we have uh, the cell cycle listed here again, right? Let's look at it. The second row here, so right here, is showing you the number of chromosomes that occur at each of these stages, given the pictures I gave you on the previous slides. So it's sort of nice. So you can see that we have this going from four to eight, right, as the sister chromatids separate. I don't think I agree with your text right here. If you look at this, it says four. What they mean is four right here, but what they mean is there's also four on that part, right? So if this is still one cell, technically, I think you still got to say four plus four equals eight at this stage. Um, I would never ask you a question on that because it's just getting picky and silly. <laughs> you know? uh, really, here to here is the very clear uh, you know, question I could ask you or you could think of in terms of the number of chromosomes. Okay, the final thing I want to say is that you can also say not only how many chromosomes are there, but how many strands of DNA are there or how many DNA molecules are there. There are actually two different questions. And if you understand the chromosome one, how you say how many chromosomes there are in a picture, this other question, how many DNA molecules there are, is going to be very easy, actually, which is nice. So on this one, all you're saying literally is how many lines are there, right? How many strands are there? And that's the answer. And here it's in more graphical form. So we have sort of a bracket. So this last one here is bracketed over all these. So we start with what? In this picture, we have four strands. Okay, so on our little line graph, we have either what? Zero, four, or eight. Those are options. We're starting at four. 
right? Um, after we get synthesis, when we replicate the DNA, we go up to eight, right? And here we're at eight. See, that line extends. And you can see in this cell, we have eight, right? Not eight chromosomes, but eight strands, eight lines, right? Eight sister chromatids. And then that number continues all the way till you get here. This is where your book and I, or this visual and I would disagree, right? I would say you continue here because it's still one cell. Here they're saying you go back down because the cell's splitting. Again, this is a bit of a semantic point. It depends, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're calling this one cell or two cells, I would call it one cell until it divides all the way. But again, this part I wouldn't worry about too much. I'm really focusing on this interaction from here to here. This is really one you could sort of discuss the issue and see if someone understands the difference between chromosomes and strands of DNA. Okay. A few final odds and ends to note here on the cell cycle. So whenever we have cytokinesis, right, which is the cell division at the very end, in animals, it's something we call an invagination uh, of the membrane, right? So we say invagination of the membrane. In other words, it's called a cleavage furrow, right? The membrane starts to push in through this uh, contractile ring of uh, microfilaments, and that's how you get your daughter cells. If we have cytokinesis in plants, again, we're focusing on humans, but just to mention, it's good to know, in plants, uh, you don't get this invagination of the membrane because plants have a cell wall. It's very rigid. So instead, you basically get something that's basically a new cell wall starting to form between the two. And you can see that right here. Uh, when it's starting to form, it's called a cell plate. It's the word we use. When it's fully formed and you have two new cells that are totally independent daughter cells, then we say it's a new cell wall because it's done. And this is what it looks like if you were to look at a nice little microscope picture. So you could see the cell plate forming right here. So this will soon be one cell and this will soon be one cell. Okay, if we look at mitosis and meiosis compared. So today we talked about the cell cycle, right? That's what we talked about. But um, within the cell cycle, you have mitosis. And there's something else called meiosis that's very similar on a superficial level. But as soon as you go into any depth at all, you realize it's very different. So let's talk about the two just so we don't get confused. So we talked about mitosis today, right? And what does it do? What's the function? It's for asexual reproduction, for cloning, basically, right? For growth, for repair. So a young child growing, as they grow, they're getting more and more cells through mitosis. As a cell is damaged, it could be repaired through mitosis. Uh, not a cell, excuse me, as a, a wound, like a skin wound is uh, damaged, you know, um, or skin wound occurs. <laughs> you could repair it through mitosis, through cell division. Uh, it occurs in somatic cells. Soma in Greek means body. So these are cells of the body. And then it produces clones at the end. Meiosis, on the other hand, which we did not talk about today, but just to compare and contrast, because you'll see it very soon. Meiosis, the function is sexual reproduction. Uh, meiosis is happening when a man produces his sperm or a woman produces her egg. That's when meiosis is happening. And it provides genetic variation. It occurs in the germ cells. Germ cells, we mean the sex cells, right? So egg and sperm. And it produces variable offspring. Okay, so we'll keep those two separate. So they look very superficial if you look at pictures, diagrams of each, but realize there's a very big difference between the two. Okay, so we talked about the cell cycle. Let's take a, a few minutes at the end here to talk about cell development. Okay, so whenever we talk about cells, we always want to say that some cells have genetic potential, right? And some cells really don't have much genetic potential. Let's talk about the difference here. When we say genetic potential, a good way to think about it, it's just an analogy, is a young child that's born, right? So a young child that's born, let's talk about their occupation. You know, that young child, right, he or she could become a doctor or a lawyer or a business person, uh, or they could become a teacher, uh, or they might go into computer animation, right? There's all these different jobs they could fill. So they have a lot of potential. Notice the word I'm using, a lot of potential. Uh, however, as that child develops, right, let's say you're in college now. If you're in uh, a biology class, you're probably going to do something in science. You don't have to, right, but probably, right? Less likely that you're going to become an artist at that stage. You're starting to become differentiated, right? You're losing potential. Not that you couldn't switch, right? But, you know, you're starting to sort of find your niche in terms of what you would do. Uh, as someone's at the end of their career and they spent their whole career as a lawyer, let's say, uh, pretty much they were differentiated. They became a lawyer, right? So it's such an analogy, but you sort of get the idea. So differentiated cells are cells that are reaching their genetic potential and it's being determined. In other words, uh, they have a complete genome, but they're specialized. So they're muscle cells, they're skin cells, uh, they're nerve cells. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, if you can reverse the differentiation, which doesn't really happen naturally uh, in humans, right? Uh, at least to our knowledge to date, uh, then maybe you could, you know, reprogram these cells. But in general, they're cells that are done um, exploring, if you will, right? They've become what they're going to become. They've, they've realized their potential, and now there is no potential anymore. They're differentiated, and that's a word that we're going to use. 
Okay, let's compare and contrast these, and I think you'll get the difference. So we also have cells that are called stem cells. And these cells here, so this whole last bracket, these stem cells, they actually uh, have a lot of potential, right? They have not decided what they're going to be yet. They're not totally specialized yet. And there's different degrees of those we'll cover. Uh, but, but you know, those are cells that are sort of interesting, and we all have them. And they're cells that people are investigating, these stem cells, for a lot of therapeutic purposes. So there's two main categories, right? There's embryonic stem cells and there's adult stem cells. Let's go ahead and talk about this a bit further. Okay, before we talk about the difference between adult and embryonic stem cells, let's really talk about all stem cells for a split second here. They all have special characteristics. So they can all self-renew, right? So stem cells can make new stem cells indefinitely, and that's important. They also have asymmetric cell division. And so what we mean by that is uh, it's sort of an extension of the first one. So if we have one stem cell at the top here, and let's say it divides, right, and you produce two daughter cells, one of these daughter cells would be a stem cell, right, sort of like the parent. But then the second daughter cell, and I'll just sort of color it in, if I can, <laughs> sort of color it in, that second stem cell is starting to differentiate, starting to become something, which makes sense, right? We want to keep our supply of stem cells that we have on the left here, but some of them through division have to start becoming something, right? So that's asymmetric cell division, the fact that the division is not equal. And then finally, all stem cells can relocate or differentiate. They can move or migrate throughout the body, and they can specialize. Okay, so how do these cells differentiate? So let's look at it in terms of a fertilized egg and take that through uh, to the end uh, and see you know, how these cells, uh, the potential of these cells change over time. Okay, so at the top we have a fertilized egg, right? And the cells at the fertilized egg, until they reach about the eight cell stage, right, the eight cell stage, we call them totipotent. In other words, they can turn into anything. So if you took one of those cells and you cultured it and you induced it to differentiate, in theory, you could make it turn into any cell of the body, including the placenta and extra embryonic tissues, everything, right? It's called totipotent, sort of the word you want to emphasize there. As time goes on, we eventually have uh, cells that are further differentiated, right? And these cells are called pluripotent. And you see these um, in this structure here called the inner cell mass, it's called. And these can turn into almost everything, but not everything, right? So they cannot form an entire human being, right? They cannot form an entire human being. They can generate every cell in the body, except they cannot do the placenta or the extra embryonic tissue. So they've lost some potency, right? They become a little bit more differentiated. As we go further, what we can see is that we could take some of these cells, right? We could try to culture them in a dish to induce them to uh, become certain types of cells we could use for therapy. That's sort of the left here, right? Or if they follow their natural course, what's going to happen is they're going to further differentiate, right? And they're going to differentiate into things that are called multipotent, right? Called multipotent. And so what happens is, as time is going on, they're becoming less, less plastic. They're losing plasticity, right? They're becoming more differentiated. They're losing their potential or they're losing their plasticity. And so these cells at this stage are multipotent. And what we mean by that is they can turn into a certain number of cells within a category. So for example... Hematopoietic stem cells are multipotent stem cells, but they can only turn to different types of blood cells. Neural stem cells are, again, multipotent stem cells. And I write that word down, multipotent. They can become different cells of the nervous system, but they're not going to become a blood cell. Mesenchymal stem cells can become uh, connective tissue or bone or cartilage, etc., but they're not going to become nerve cells. So they're starting to become more and more specialized as time goes on. So again, to highlight, right, we have totipotent, become anything, pluripotent, almost everything, and then we have multipotent here that are sort of restricted to a specific class. Okay, so what cellular diversity exists in differentiated cells? So once they differentiate all the way, what, you know, what kind of, what categories do we have? So we could have cells that line and connect body parts, right? So these are like epithelial cells, uh, fibroblasts, uh, erythrocytes. We have cells that move organs and body parts, right? We have mus muscular cells. We have cells that store nutrients. We have fat cells. We have cells that fight disease. We have macrophages. We have cells of the nervous system. And then finally, we have cells of reproduction. You see a sperm here. Another one would be an egg. So the final thing we want to focus on today are what are the different theories of why we age? 
So there's a few different theories, and there's more than just this, that these are sort of the main three, right? So people believe that we age due to formation of free radicals that occur, right? And these free radicals can occur from many, many um, situations. And free radicals are considered dangerous because they steal electrons from biological molecules, and they can cause, cause damage to the macromolecules in your cells. And so it could happen as a byproduct of metabolism. They just happen naturally, right? You know, through living. Uh, or they can be uh, caused by exposure to different uh, types of radiation, right? Different types of radiation or carcinogens like smoking or through air pollution. You sort of get the idea. So that's one theory of aging, the free radical theory. Another theory of free, uh, excuse me, of aging is the genetic theory of aging. And this is saying, you know, we age because it's in our genes. Our genes dictate that cells should divide for a certain amount of time, and then they should stop dividing and they should start dying. And there's some evidence for this in cell culture, this genetic theory of aging. Uh, if you culture a lot of cells in cell culture, they often grow or split about, you know, 30 or 50 times, right? They divide that number of times then they just stop dividing a lot of cells. And so there is some you know, evidence that this could be um, you know, a valid theory of aging. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, it could be because of these telomeres, right? It could be these telomeres are getting damaged over time. They fray just like the plastic end of your shoelace. And then the whole shoelace frays or the whole chromosome frays. Many people think that a more comprehensive theory of aging should be applied, and that would be sort of including all three of these, right? So we don't have to stick with one or the other. They could all come into play, and then there's other theories as well. Okay, so in today's lecture, we focused on the cell cycle. We focused on cell development uh, to sort of continue this conversation about the cellular level of organization. As always, before you pre proceed to the next lecture, please, please make sure that you can execute these learning objectives. If you can do these, you're good to go. You understand this lecture at this stage in the game. If you're not able to do these, and the key thing is do them, right? Make sure you can execute them. Then I would suggest you rewatch the lecture and please come see me with any questions.